Ok, sí, ahí está el recording. Got it. Ok, so I think we can start, right? It's time. Ok, so perfect. Thank you, everyone that is here in this PhD defense. So I would like you to introduce AFISC PhD student uh, Tobia Mazzoli, Mattia Mazzoli, sorry, who will present today his uh, thesis titled Human Mobility, Data Analysis, Theory and Models, which has been completed and directed by doctors Jose Javier Ramasco and Pere Colet, who are here. Uh, I would also like to introduce you to the committee members for me in the panel that will evaluate the thesis today. So we have, uh, first of all, the secretary, uh, Dr. Elsa Arcaute of the University College London, in London, UK, of course. Then we have uh, the vocal, that is Dr. Chiara Poletto of ISERMS and Sorbonne University in Paris, France. And the president should have been Dr. Jesus Gomez Gardenas of the University of Zaragoza, but due to some very unfortunate circumstances, he couldn't make it, so I will go into to be in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his place. I'm a Massimiliano Zanin, also a doctor here at IFISC. So without further ado, uh, let's move to the our representation by the candidate, by the PhD student. As you know, you have between 45 minutes and uh, one hour. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Massimiliano. Uh, okay, uh, welcome everybody and thank you for being here today, especially in this time of the year. So as uh, Massimiliano Zanin already said, the title of my thesis will be uh, Human Mobility, Data Analysis, Theory and Models. And uh, I have to thank you to thank my two uh, supervisors, Jose Javier Amasco and Pere Colle. So uh, human mobility nowadays can be intended in many ways. Uh, human mobility occurs in uh, actions that we do on a daily basis or sporadically. It can be commuting, hence going to work, go to the airport, migrating, uh, go out for sports, an evacuation during an emergency, many things. And indeed mobility can be defined by purpose. Hence people going to work, hence commuting, uh, other recurring mobility like going out for leisure or for, for food, uh, migration intended as city to city or for the crossing, tourism, and other more specific of the above. And also, we can study it uh, using different scales, using transportation networks at individual, urban, or regional scale, or even country at scale, and so on. Why is it really important to study human mobility? Uh, human mobility is uh, at the center of many and diverse applications, and it can be used to study the urban structure of cities, understand how to reduce traffic pollution and also uh, understand the demand for new infrastructures in urban areas. It can also be used to study and inform uh, containment policies for epidemic spread in case we see from the current pandemic, and also other related studies on socioeconomic uh, studies, tourism analysis, evacuations uh, during emergency protocols, and uh, uh, study humanitarian response during migration. And this is also reflected uh, in, the, in the scientific literature. We see there are many papers on uh, uh, travel restrictions, immigrant uh, integration in other countries, touristic, st touristic site attractiveness, studying uh, uh, traffic uh, to, uh, toll to reduce the traffic in big cities. And of course, mobility is not the way it was before. 2000 years ago, it took space to march from Rome to other cities of Italy, or nowadays we have way more offer of uh, uh, infrastructures, we have faster movements, we do long range trips, we have much more accessibility and hence uh, much more uh, displacements and massive displacements from one country to the other, connecting the world. In this thesis, I will show four different types of application of human mobility. On one side, we have migration, then we have commuting, emergency evacuations, and finally, the second part of the thesis will uh, be about epidemic spreading. The first thing that we have to say is that that data doesn't speak for itself. And the first one to notice this was Ravenstein in 1885. Ravenstein was a German English geographer and he studied the UK census uh, during uh, in 1885 from one decade to the other. And basically Ravenstein noticed that uh, the death and birth records in the UK census did not explain completely the change of population in the, in the different areas. So there was his interpretation was that there was a, an underlying process of uh, mainly uh, migration 
from uh, peripheral areas of uh, the United Kingdom towards uh, economically wealthier areas like London, Birmingham, and Manchester in England. And uh, uh, this is uh, the fact is that we, we also need an interpretation for the data. We cannot take it as it is. And of course, the other thing is that we don't have a perfect data type for everything that we want to do. Depending on the purpose of our study, we have to accurately select and choose what data set we need to make uh, to, to, for our purpose. So for example, you cannot study uh, migration using census because it's released every five, 10 years. And at the same time, you cannot study uh, proximity contacts using social media data like Twitter. Hence, the, what are the problems of uh, not interpreting the data and take the data as it is? The problem is that in the end, if you take the data as it is, you will find that, uh, for example, data of movements of refugees and migrants are flowed in the European Union. You don't have a, a consistent data set telling you how many people you have uh, from other countries within the European uh, Union. And this provokes a great misunderstanding of the phenomenon and sort of misquantification of the phenomenon that you have. So in these, uh, in these studies, uh, summing up, uh, I will show you six different works. And depending on the context that we want to study, we have to apply uh, different scales to our, uh, of resolution uh, of, our, uh, of our data and also using different data sets. So for example, we want to study migration uh, at country scale in South America. We can use uh, a coarse uh, resolution of 40 per 40 square kilometers, while while if you want to study commuting in urban areas, you have to go to final states like one square kilometer. So the first thing is, of course, data treatment. Here I show you three examples. For example, with migration data and with the data, we have to remove people moving too fast and also people that uh, typically have uh, uh, long range trips only. So these are probably bots or uh, users that uh, are uh, typically company accounts used by many people around the world. And this is also true for uh, the data set that we use for commuting. Indeed, uh, again, we remove people uh, traveling too fast, competing too much. And finally, uh, as an, uh, an example regarding epidemic spreading, when we use cubic data, we have to remove people with less than a certain amount of location points in the whole data set because they need to have consistent trajectories to track their movement. So the first study that I show you is a migrant mobility flows characterized in digital data. This was a collaboration with UNICEF uh, Innovation Department. And what we did was to study the uh, massive, uh, massive uh, displacement of uh, migrants from Venezuela to other parts of the, of the American continent. So um, what we did was to uh, analyze tweets during four years in this place, uh, in, in this uh, bounding box of uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the whole Central and South America. And we develop four different methods to understand who is a resident of Venezuela, actually. So we take uh, for uh, all the users, the most common tweeted country per month. And uh, we see them appearing uh, three months in a row or two months in a row, or any of the others, uh, we consider them as residents. Finally, we will stick to the fourth method since it's more representative. And in the end, we wanna check every year how many of these users appear in a different country. And as we can see, it doesn't really matter what method we use, but um, the estimations are very consistent with uh, those uh, provided by official estimations uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the United Nations. And on the panel on the right, we see that these estimations are specifically uh, better when we analyze uh, movements to countries, uh, bordering countries like Colombia or Brazil, and also the closest uh, Hispanic speaking uh, countries like Peru and Ecuador. More specifically, uh, we can analyze the main direction of flows of people uh, going away from Venezuela or going back to Venezuela because migration is not a unique type of process and people don't just migrate for good and then they never go back. We have uh, some kind of a currency by analyzing how much time do they spend abroad after the first exit. And we can see that, okay, the, 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 despite the numbers of the flows are not consistence, of course, with the, those uh, that are, which should be realistic. In this case, we can make a comparison between two different routes of migration. 
In this case, we didn't know how many people were crossing the border with Brazil. Indeed, Brazil reached many people from Venezuela, but then many people also went back to Venezuela because of problems of integration in the north of the country. While on the other side, uh, along the Pan-American road, uh, the flow is much more sustained, uh, and this is also observed in, in the rest of the year. So we can say by this picture that the two flows are not really, really comparable. And also, of course, this uh, spatial tracking of migration patterns can help understand and inform humanitarian response in real time, in the sense that, of course, we cannot see from one day to the other what is the displacement of people, but at least we don't have to wait months or years for new records coming from border crossing, from border uh, authorities and, uh, and censuses. Finally, going to infinite scale, we can also check the integration of these communities of migrants in other, uh, in their new hometowns like Bogota, Sao Paulo and Lima. On the top row, we see uh, the migrant distribution and in the lower row, uh, in the bottom row, we see the resident distribution. And comparing these two distributions, we can understand whether they are more or less integrating the, the new community or not. Studying the same uh, type of data and Peter data, we can also study the commuting in cities. In this study, field theory for equivalent mobility, we analyze uh, the most common place for every user along four years in big cities like London, Paris, Rio de Janeiro, Tokyo, and so on. Uh, there is a microphone open. I think. Okay. And um, uh, so we, for every user along the four years, we analyze uh, their home place uh, and the workplace by taking the most common place at night and uh, at, uh, during the day and uh, during weekdays. Uh, when we did this with all the users that we have, we build our origin destination matrices. And finally, we make uh, a, a, a vectorial sum defining the resulting outflow uh, vector in every area of the city. Hence, we are defining a, a field. And as you can see in the, uh, in the bottom row, we have a field uh, that is clearly uh, attractive towards the center of the city as it falls uh, a, a gravitational field. And also this field proves to uh, fulfill the, the Gauss theorem. Hence, uh, if we, for this Gauss theorem, uh, independently of which surface of integration we use, and this is telling us that we have a source of our field and also that we can compute fluxes of this vector field at different distances from a given center of the city. And moreover, this field uh, proves to be rotational, or at least uh, the, the curl of the field, the empirical field proves to be closer to zero than a null model that we build by simply reshuffling the direction randomly uh, around the city. So we, uh, we accept this uh, as, a, as a, an, an irrotational field, and hence we can integrate it. And as you can see on the left, we have the, the data, the empirical integrated uh, vector field that gives us the empirical potential. And in the center, we have for London and Paris, the model reproduced vector field integrated, hence the model uh, reproduced potential. And the agreement is very good. As you can see, this model is a gravity model. And uh, we also made a comparison with other models like the radiation model and the extended radiation, but the gravity model in this case proved to, uh, to fit best. Finally, the, in all the cities under study, we can define a commuting potential that is informing, uh, uh, is, uh, that is telling us the polycentricity of cities. Of course, there are other methods to, to define the polycentricity in city. In, indeed, uh, this metric should be probably integrated and compared to other metrics that already exist on this, but we recover results that were already known in the literature. As for example, the Manchester Liverpool Leeds Sheffield Poll is a very uh, connected, is very connected system. You cannot really say that they are different cities independently, independent from one another. Rio de Janeiro appear to, appears to be polycentric, while Tokyo uh, it looks very uh, monocentric. And finally, the center seems to be something in the middle between a polycentric and a monocentric uh, city. A similar approach can be applied to uh, crowd evacuation during emergencies. In this uh, collaboration with the Universidad de Navarra, 
uh, we studied the evacuation phase. Specifically, we had videos of experiments uh, led by students and the Spanish army in which we told uh, them to basically uh, evacuate the room as soon as you can through the door that is on the, on the bottom by applying two different levels of uh, competitiveness. So in one case, we told them just relax, everybody's gonna survive, don't push each other, follow the rules. In the middle case, uh, we told them, okay, push the others a little bit, uh, but don't go crazy. And finally, on the, on the high competitiveness level, we told them to run for your life. So we have these videos, and as you can see, at each stamp snapshot, we can define the average, uh, the average uh, speed vector in each area mm -hmm. of the room. And we do this with all the experiments, and when you repeat all these, you, you average over all the experiments and for the same uh, set of parameters, in the Okay, competitiveness, uh, we have an average field of speed in the room. And this is the result. So depending on how much uh, you are competitive in the, in the evacuation, we have different scenarios. The low competitive scenario uh, exhibits low speeds in the back of the room, while uh, you have higher speeds when you approach the door on the bottom. While this is not really true when you have high competitiveness, in the sense that uh, people in the back uh, exhibit some kind of a turbulence uh, effect and they start pushing each other and they move fast from one place to the other. So at that point, uh, the vector feed is not really attractive and strictly going to the door, but it starts moving a little bit and we have some kind of fluctuations here that are critical uh, uh, for the understanding of the dynamic. Again, we want to prove if this uh, field is rotational or not. And we see that the empirical uh, sum of the curl uh, along the area is very close to a baseline value that is given by simply uh, redirecting all the vectors strictly towards the door without any fluctuation, while applying uh, an increasing amount of normal noise to the, to the vector's uh, directions, we have much, much higher uh, values of the curl uh, overall. Hence, in all the cases, we can uh, uh, consider this as a, a rotational field and integrate. And again, I'll show you on the left the low competitiveness empirical uh, potential, and on the right the model potential. The model potential is uh, obtained by simply fitting uh, uh, an O'Reilly distribution to the the, the to the empirical uh, potential. This really uh, distribution uh, basically informing the potential of the model and comes from uh, a psychological uh, effect that is given by the fact that when people see the, the, the door, they actually uh, believe the, um, behave differently uh, with respect to before. And when they see the door, they start pushing and they start move, moving faster. And in integrating this, uh, this behavior along the space as a function of the distance from the door, we can understand what is the, 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 the model potential, the theoretical potential that uh, is informing the, the desired speed of evacuation in the room. And as you can see, in the top row, on the left, we have low competition, on the right, high competition. This model works uh, best when we have low competition, because of course, when you have high fluctuations and high uh, movements in the back, this, uh, this behavior, this average behavior is attributed and uh, this, uh, analysis, this uh, approach is not really uh, fulfilled. Okay, so we saw that uh, human mobility can have many and diverse applications, uh, studying uh, migration, studying commuting, studying uh, evacuation uh, protocols. But uh, what can really human mobility do in the current situation of the, of the first the pandemic? So in this work in collaboration with the Foundation, Cubic and Kira Dynamics, we studied uh, how the phenomenon called multi-seeding and lockdowns shaped uh, the COVID-19 local impact at different uh, provincial and regional scales in Europe. So uh, what happened? When I was still living in Spain during the first wave of uh, 2020, we understood that uh, at some point, the patterns of the uh, cumulative uh, SARS-CoV-2 cases in, uh, in Spain at provincial level really resembled a pattern of diffusion from Madrid. So on the right panel, we have the fraction of people moving from Madrid in log scale to the other provinces. And this 
it was something that started uh, sparking the, the debate among us about whether the interest could be related to mobility. Of course, we know that mobility is important for epidemic spreading, but at, at, at what point at this scale is important? So uh, with the arrow, you can see uh, I indicated Saudi because Saudi uh, directly in the first wave of, uh, of COVID-19 in 2020 had a collapse of uh, the health uh, local system. Hence, uh, Saudi is not a very populated uh, area, it is a low, has a low density of population, but has a low, uh, high fraction of people traveling from Madrid with respect to the local population. So how did we prove that mobility was important? We took uh, the epidemic records from provinces in Spain, 52 provinces, and we take the peak, and we define for each province an onset date uh, defined on a threshold uh, of daily incidence. So once uh, these provinces reach this, uh, this threshold, we set an onset, as we do for patients. And, um, and then we check the mobility from three weeks to one week before the onset date from the rest of the country. So what we do is here, for example, uh, this example uh, regards Italy, we define a new metric of uh, correlation which simply takes the correlation between the mobility from the tested uh, or epidemic epicenter, in this case of Milan, and the rest of the country, and their local incidence peaks. And then we do this for all the provinces of Italy. And as you can see, Milan is the one with the darkest uh, color, hence uh, maximizing this, uh, this score of, uh, of epidemic epicenter in the and we did this with also five, uh, with, all, uh, with uh, overall five countries uh, in Europe, hence England. In England, it was uh, the epidemic epicenter, uh, could be Lancashire, in France, Champagne Ardennes, in Grandes region, in Germany, Munich, in Bavaria, in Italy, it was Milan, and in Spain, uh, Madrid. Basically, it's not possible to, to demonstrate that these were actually the true places from where the, the epidemic started from. But many uh, studies in the literature consider these as being the, the parts of this country that started the spread of COVID. And we are not checking the places that got hit before, but we check the places that contributed most to the spreading to the rest of the country. Sorry. So, uh, okay, uh, we made our hypothesis, but then we have to test it in, a, in an ideal uh, scenario. So we build a, a, an SEIIR model, a compartmental model, uh, using a metapopulation scheme. So we have all the provinces in Spain, and uh, the movements between provinces are informed by mobile phone data, while the contacts within the, pro in the provinces are a uh, model to two different scenarios, for a lattice and a, an homogeneous mixing. So what we see here, we have a scenario in which we have no lockdown and a scenario in which we have, no, uh, we have a national lockdown. When no lockdown is implemented, we see that the number of trips that the provinces receive from uh, other, uh, from other, when provinces receive from, from Madrid, in this case, it is the design epidemic at the center, we have uh, a plain, um, we have a plain, uh, we have no, basically no correlation in the sense that uh, receiving more trips with, uh, with respect to the local population uh, doesn't uh, really tell you uh, that you have a higher peak of incidence in the end of the epidemic. But of course this happens because this looks like, okay, you have no multi-seeding effect, but the multi-seeding effect is occurring in the, uh, in the background and it already occurred and it occurs so much that you, in the end, you cannot distinguish anything from the, uh, the epidemic epicenter signal. While when you have a lockdown, you stop the spreading at national scale and all the mobility when Madrid, uh, before the Madrid, which is the peak, then at that point, all the outbreaks developed uh, uh, within the provinces are independent with, uh, with one another Hence, the, the, the outbreak severity in each province uh, depends on the number of seats that you received at the beginning, in the first place, from Madrid. And of course, maybe even from other provinces, indeed, the, there are some fluctuations. But we see that even in the homogeneous mixing, the trend is very clear. So the number of, the more you receive uh, trips from Madrid, uh, the more the incoming mobility with respect to your local population from Madrid, the more your incidence peak uh, will be higher. And uh, the same is also true, and it's even more enhanced uh, when you have a spatial network like the lattice. 
Hence, this can tell us when uh, and where we have to intervene. Once a region like Madrid, or can be also uh, Barcelona, could it, could it, have be, it could have been Bilbao, Sevilla, or other places in Spain and also in Europe. When one place gets hit very strong by, uh, by an epidemic, we know where we have to intervene next, because those places that will be affected next are those places that were connected in the last two weeks by mobility. A similar scenario uh, was uh, observed uh, within cities. We analyzed uh, 22, the 22 uh, top uh, most populated cities in, uh, in the US in this collaboration with Queen Mary University, University of Rochester, and Google. Uh, so basically here we want to study the impact of urban structure on COVID-19 spread. Ur urban structure in what sense? So we have urban mobility and we can define hotspots of the urban mobility. So following the method for this paper, uh, we can define the, the top, the 10 top hotspots of every city. And once we define the top uh, 10 hotspots of the city, we can define a, a hierarchy score which is basically a, a sort of a, a sort of activity between the hotspots levels. In the term, in the sense of uh, how much these output levels share uh, an amount of mobility with respect to the total flow of the city. Hence, the more the hotspot, uh, uh, the more the flows are occurring between uh, hotspots of the same level, the more the sensitivity, the more the hierarchy of the city. And we have three examples in the lower uh, row. We have Paris, that is very uh, hierarchic. In Bangkok, this is in the middle level, and Los Angeles that is very small. As you can see, the top level of hotspots is very, uh, very small. But still, uh, they are hierarchic cities with respect to other cities in the US. Indeed, uh, the spectrum of the hierarchy in the US goes more or less from 07 to 0990, which is New York. And uh, in this case, we saw that analyzing the first wave of COVID-19 uh, epidemic records, uh, the hierarchy of the city affected both the, the speed of spreading in the early stages and also the, uh, in the incidence peak during the first wave. So in panel A, we see that New York is the, the top hierarchic uh, city in, uh, in the USA. It, uh, it has an uncomparable uh, speed of spreading with respect to other cities, especially with respect to Atlanta, uh, Cincinnati, or Pittsburgh. While uh, the same is true, as uh, the speed of spreading is faster, uh, it also reflects in the epidemic, in the, in the incidence peak during the first wave. In red, we isolated those cities that did not reach the peak yet at that point. And this was more or less May 2020. And as you can see, uh, if you discard this, the correlation between the hierarchy score and the, the incident peak of this city is, is, is very clear. But on the other side, we have cities that are more hierarchic and they uh, provoke uh, more severe outbreaks. On the, other, on the other hand, the more the hierarchy of the city, the more they respond better to containment policy. And in the panel D, we show this. As you can see, New York is one of, uh, is one of the, the best cities to respond to containment policies. So how do we do this? We take the, the, the counties of each of the city, and then we check the synchronization between these counties uh, in terms of correlation between uh, four weeks uh, uh, in a row, uh, um, reductions of mobility and the reduction in the, in the speed of spreading of these counties. So the more they are synchronized, the more the, the response score is higher. And as you can see, we have some kind of inertia principle here going on. So we have cities that are very hierarchic, like New York, they, they, they accelerate very fast once they are seated uh, and they uh, exhibit very high peak of incidence. But then when you apply containment policies, they also stop very fast. On the other hand, where Atlanta, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, uh, Portland have uh, uh, taken much more time to start a, a severe outbreak, but then when you want to stop it, it's much more, uh, it's, much, it's much harder. And then we reproduce this effect by, again, using a compartmental model, um, taking three cities and reshuffling uh, their links of mobility from one neighborhood to the other in order to produce for each of these three cities 10 fake copies, one of which uh, more uh, less hierarchic than the other. And we see that 
with these 30 cities, in the end, we see that the hierarchy score is very influential in the speed of spreading in the early stages and also in the, in the final, uh, in the overall incidence, uh, incidence peak. And of course, the, the more the speed of spreading at the beginning, the faster the, the time to reach the peak uh, arrives. And also, okay, we also see something that, of course, in the, in the in the empiric, in the data cannot be observed yet, but we saw that also this affects the final size in the system. Finally, going at even final scales, we studied a spatial immunization policy to apply uh, in specific uh, buildings that are very sensitive to, to potential outbreaks like airports. And this was a collaboration with Fondazione Bruno Kessler and, and Kubik. So, okay, we saw the meta population scheme already. So, uh, of course, it's important to notice that uh, once you break links, you probably delay the, the epidemic spreading from, uh, from starting in the new population, but this is all uh, as it has only an effect of delay. So in the end, the, the epidemic will spread anyway to the other parts of the country if no other measures are applied. But we want to prevent here another phenomenon. So we have people traveling from population I to population J, but when you have population traveling from airports, it can be the population, infected population from I traveling to J are also affecting populations, affecting the population of I traveling to other parts of the globe, hence the population K, L, M, and so on. Hence, we want to prevent this, and we uh, implement spatial immunization policy using cubic data in a Heathrow Airport in London during the uh, studying the uh, trajectory from uh, passengers and workers during six months. How do we treat this data? We have to crystallize the, the data in, a, in a 10 per 10 square meter space cells in 15 minute time slots. Then we have to apply super sampling in order to get a reasonable amount of users per day. And once we get this standard data, we can repeat it in order to perform analysis and simulations for one week and so on. We have, of course, to uh, reconstruct the trajectories using the data driven optimal path. And finally, uh, once we have this, all of this, uh, all this information, we can build a comprehensive temporal network that tells us that every 10 slots who is in contact with home. It's not really the same to analyze the behavior of travelers and workers in the airport in the sense that travelers, as you can see, when you aggregate the contact network for one month only, uh, exhibit a, a contact, um, uh, exhibit no giant component and they are very sparse, the links of travelers in this, uh, in this system. While on the other side, workers are already a giant component that they, they, they go out, they go back to the airport every day, they share the same workplaces uh, in the terminals, so they are all more or less in contact. As you can see in panel A, once you join them together, without workers, travelers are not really connected one to the other. Mm, of course, we can classify users as we saw in workers, but also in connecting departing and arriving passengers. So what we do here is we have this picture uh, regarding uh, the, 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 it's a heat map of presences in the airport. So this is the overall aggregated uh, data set, the location points. What we do is we run a compartmental model, an SIR model, a simple SIR, and see what are the places that are more sensible to infection. So we define during the first three days of infections, with this SIR model, the top hotspots of infection in the terminals. Of course, we don't look the, the places around like roads and, uh, and other stuff. So uh, once we have this, we define the 50, the top 50, the top 100, the top 200, and so on hotspots. And then we, uh, we issue a special immunization policy that reduces 95% the spreading of the virus, the survival of the virus in the, in the place. And these are the results when uh, we apply uh, an SEIR model, uh, the same as before for uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, by implementing the spatial immunization policy. As you can see, the probability of outbreak in panel A, which is in terms uh, of uh, how many uh, how, uh, how many times you get the secondary infections in the simulation, is reduced by you know, from 30% to less than 10%, and also the severity of the outbreak in the airport is reduced from uh, 150 cases per time slot to less than 10. While in panel D, we see the limitation of this approach. Okay, this, uh, this approach seems to be very effective towards passengers traveling to international destinations in green and also other kinds of passengers. 
but doesn't seem to be very effective against the workers uh, category. So probably the workers, given that they go back to the, the airport every day, it's very hard to avoid the, for them the, the infection. So probably they should be targeted with another uh, policy, like for example, vaccination. Okay, so we saw many applications of uh, human mobility in many different contexts, but the important thing is that by this study, we can understand, we can inform policies, we can take decisions and also answer open questions. So as we saw, for example, for migration, we can uh, inform the maritime response almost real time, not really from one day to the other, but we can understand where people are passing, if they are going to the Amazon forest in dangerous places, and then from an hour, they take a boat, as we saw uh, on the Amazon River, to go to Santa Rem and, uh, and Fortaleza. And or probably going back, uh, going uh, uh, west uh, uh, towards Peru. And this is something that uh, in, the, in the next future could be very important to assess uh, whether we have to intervene in the case of massive migration. So this could also be the case uh, due to the strong uh, weather uh, conditions that, that we are experiencing in the last years, as we saw even uh, a few days ago in Canada, uh, this could also reproduce in other parts of the country. As this escalates, we can have even uh, migrations due to extreme weather events. We can help redefine urban limits and define policy intricity. And this is something that uh, can be helpful, for example, to design smart, city, smart cities, but not smart cities in the sense that they are more green in the sense that we can redefine the poles of workplaces and within the cities to reduce the amount of commuting that every day people have to do. Commuting is, uh, represents the most of, uh, of the human mobility in a city. Hence, this is a critical aspect. As we saw, smart working with the pandemic is possible for many sectors of the economy. If we are, ready, if we are able to design better cities, this probably will help a lot. Uh, on the uh, pandemic, scene, on the pandemic uh, context, uh, it is important to uh, inform the surveillance of uh, new outbreaks uh, in Europe, but this can also be applied in other different countries of the world. Once we have a place that exhibits a high, a strong outbreak, we are uh, we have to keep under surveillance those places that are most connected with them in terms of mobility in order to prevent the spreading to the rest of the country. And this is true also from a urban perspective. We have cities in the US, but also in other places. European cities are even more erratic on average than, uh, than, uh, than US cities. Once you have a city like New York, that is very erratic and exhibits a fast spreading, you have to ring the alarm to the rest of the country before it spreads to the rest of the territory. Because it's not the same to have a strong outbreak in Atlanta or Pittsburgh, or have a strong outbreak in Chicago or in New York. And also, we can redesign your, uh, the urban structure. If this is an example from the past, of course, it's not the same as we are tell, telling you now with the data, but Altman uh, redesigned Paris in order to have a, a, a faster, uh, an easier connection between the neighbors, but also to have more uh, ventilation and space, public space, to make sure that uh, people could be less in contact with one another. This is also true uh, as London and other historic cities went through a process of redesign after the pandemic of the past. And finally, we can design COVID-free areas in, a, in a very sensitive uh, places like airports, but it can, can also be true for schools, libraries, town halls, and train stations. Uh, by applying uh, special immunization policies in the most exposed places to infection, we can reduce sensibly the probability of uh, having an outbreak. And uh, this is also a reality in Hong Kong uh, airport, where there is this robot that goes around and flashes with UV lights that are not helpful for people to prevent the virus to survive uh, on the surface, for example. So there are many, many things that uh, can we do, uh, we can do with human mobility, and there are many more that are yet to be done, uh, but uh, for now, it is uh, all for today. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you a lot. Perfectly on time also, which is very good. So we will move now to the Q&A uh, 